Kia ora tato. Last video we learned about what linear transformations were. Um, we learned that they were transformations between vector spaces Rn and Rm, and we showed that they could always be represented using matrices. That's quite cool, and what we promised you was that in this video we would look at quite a few geometrical examples of linear transformations, um, and we'd build and we'd show what the standard matrices of these things actually were. Okay, so Remember, the standard matrix of a transformation T that takes Rn to Rn, we can figure that out by just figuring out what it does to the standard unit vectors E1 through to En. So we saw that the standard matrix is just simply the matrix with T of E1, T of E2 through to T of En as its columns. So we have the tools in hand. So what we're going to do in this video is to explore some common geometrical operations that are actually linear transformations and then work out what their matrices look like. Now to help us visualize this stuff, I've built a GeoGebra applet that lets us explore the effect of specifying where those two basis vectors, E1 and E2, are mapped to. So if you look on the screen here, this point A is going to be where the vector E1 ends up, and this point B is going to be where the vector 0, 1, that's E2, ends up after the transformation. So you can see that as I move these points, the column of the matrix T will vary accordingly. So if I move zero, one, sorry, 1, 0 through to 2, 0, then that should mean the first column of, of my matrix becomes 2, 0, and you see it does indeed. The other thing is we can see what geometrically is happening by looking at this sort of triangle, triangular kind of shape here. So if you think of any point on that shape as a position vector, then the corresponding point on the green shape is where that gets mapped to under the transformation defined by this matrix T. Okay, so let's just see it play around with a few settings and see what we can produce. So when I dragged this one, it looked like it scaled my picture in the horizontal direction. And you might guess that if I do the same thing for my second vector, it scales in the vertical direction. So what I've produced here that's just my 2, 0, 0, 2. That's the scaling matrix of the scaling transformation that we talked about last time. And you can see that it blows up my picture by scaling each dimension by 2. What else can we do? Well, I could just put them back for a second where they were. I might zoom slightly in so I can get on the ones properly. So what happens if I, if I move one of these over like this? It looks like I can reflect my object in this axis. So I could do the similar thing with the B1. I can reflect it in my horizontal axis this way. And I can in fact mess around with these and I can do all sorts of different things. If I move this one over here, I get this weird sort of sideways squishy thing. And I could even kind of rotate my picture around if I sort of move these vectors like this. I can actually rotate this figure around. So we're gonna try and figure out what some of these transformations actually are and verify their linear and then look at their standard standard things. Okay, so um, if we reflect, let's uh, just reset it. So let's look at reflection in, the, um, in a mirror line through the origin first. So, uh, so we're just gonna draw ourselves a line through the origin, doesn't matter exactly which direction it points in. And what we're going to do is we're going to try and figure out that if we reflect our point in that mirror line, then this is a linear transformation. So it's pretty clear that if we add our, our points first and then reflect them, um, we get the same thing as if we reflect first and then do our vector addition. You can see it on this diagram here. Same goes for scaling. If we scale a point and then reflect it, we get the same result as if we reflect first and then scale. So it looks like these reflections are indeed linear transformations because they satisfy those two properties. So let's use our applet to figure a few of these out. So we'll look at, first we'll look at reflection in the x-axis. So in this case, our first basis vector, so you're imagining this horizontal line through the x-axis here, this point A is not going to do anything when, when we reflect it, so it should stay put. Um, but the second one, that should jump from 1, 0 to 0, negative 1. So it's just put it down there, you can see the column of the matrix is now 0, negative 1. And you can see this does indeed have the effect of reflecting that figure in the x-axis. And so the matrix of our reflection is 1, 0, 0, negative 1. Okay, let's now try a different one, so we'll reset. 
Let's try and reflect our vectors now in the line y equals x. Okay, so that's a the line with slope one going through the origin. So if we just think about what these two points a and b are going to do, in that case, they're going to actually change, exchange positions. So a is going to go up there, b is going to go down here, and that will indeed give us that reflection of our picture in the line y equals x. And so you can see that because a has moved to 0, 1 now, and b has moved to 1, 0, the matrix of that transformation is 0, 1, 1, 0. Okay, let's do one more. Let's, we did y equals x. Let's try reflecting now in the line x equals y. Uh, sorry, y equals negative x. That is the matrix, uh, sorry, the, the line that goes through the origin, but this time slopes downwards with a slope of negative 1. So if you can kind of visualize that, you can see that the point A is going to hop across to 0, negative 1. And the point B is going to hop across to negative 1, 0. And yep, so once again, we've produced this reflection, this time in the line y equals negative x. And the, mat the, uh, sorry, the matrix of this reflection is 0, negative 1, and negative 1, 0. Okay, so that's reflections. Now it turns out that rotations around the origin, they are also linear. So we're going to imagine that we have a transformation that rotates points anti-clockwise by an angle theta um, around the origin. So let's try and graphically establish that this is a linear transformation before we go and explore it. So what we're gonna do is if we do, sc we'll do scalar multiplication first. So T of C times U means we're going to stretch our vector out by a factor um, c and then we're going to rotate it and c times t of u that means we rotate first and then we stretch it by a factor of c and you can see that we actually get the same thing t of c u in both cases so it's hopefully it's fairly clear that this will always work now let's do addition so t of u plus v well that means add the two vectors first using our regular head-to-tail vector addition, and then rotate the result. And the other way around, alternatively, t of u plus t of v means rotate the two vectors first and then add them. Again, it's pretty evident that the output, the outcome of that second step gives us the same vector as the first step we did, and so we get the same result. So with a slightly hand-wavy argument, we can be pretty confident that our rotation around the origin is linear and we can build its matrix therefore by considering the effect on unit vectors. Okay, so let's just draw a sketch a new axis with our vector rotated by theta, um, an angle of theta. So the vector 1, 0, if we just look at our picture, we can see that that gets rotated to the position cosine theta and sine theta. And just sort of staring at that picture a little bit longer, we can also see that 0, 1 gets rotated to negative sine theta for the x component and cosine theta. So that means that our matrix ought to be cosine theta sine theta for the first column and then negative sine theta cosine theta for the second column. All right, so I've produced a slightly modified version of our GeoGebra applet from before. This time we have... Um, we can't drag the points A and B, they're fixed, because they are determined by this rotation. So the thing that we can adjust this time is our rotation angle, theta. So the matrix T is specified just by that formula we just derived. So if we were to, let's first try rotating anti-clockwise by 90 degrees. So that's pi over 2 radians, so that should be approximately uh, 1.57 or so. So let's just, you can see, you can see it rotating as we move it. So if we want to go 90 degrees, there we go. You can see that our figure has indeed rotated around by 90 degrees. And our matrix is 0, 1, negative 1, 0. That's because cosine of 90 is 0 and sine of 90 is 1. And so that's what the matrix comes out to be. And you can see as I move this slider around, it does indeed give us a rotation of our figure to any angle that we want. So that's 2 pi at the end there. Likewise, negative angles, they correspond to rotating clockwise. And so, again, it works exactly the same way. And this matrix always works. So you can see how those two vectors, 1, 0, and 0, 1, are mapped by looking at those points A and B. 
you can see they get rotated around just the same as the rest of the figure. Okay. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on this next one, but our next example is something called shear. And that can be expressed by a matrix, uh, sorry, a transformation of the form, for example, 1k01. Now there are other ways of specifying shears as well, but this is a horizontal shear. So let's just see what it looks like. We'll put in k equals 2. So you can see this horizontal shear kind of pushes the whole thing sideways in a sort of stretchy kind of way. Um, so our first vector stays where it is, and our second one moves across to 2, 1. So an interesting fact that we're not going to go into right now is that actually the area of this figure has stayed the same after this shear. So I've kind of smeared it out a whole, long, a whole lot, but actually the area of this thing actually stays the same no matter how much I shear it by. Okay, so, so far all of the examples we've considered have been invertible. That means they can be undone. So for example, with rotations, you can undo your rotation by rotating the opposite direction. Or you can undo your scaling by scaling by 1 over the scale factor, etc. But not all transformations or not all linear transformations are like this. So projection, that's also a linear transformation. So let's just um, imagine for a second that we are projecting points orthogonally onto our x-axis. So this translates to just dropping their y components. So the projection onto E1 of C times X1 Y1 plus D times X2 Y2 is simply CX1 plus DX2 0, just dropping the y component, which can be split into two vectors as CX1 0 plus DX2 0, which is equal to C times the projection onto E1 of X1 Y1 plus D times the projection onto E1 of X2 Y2. So we can see that this is a linear transformation because it satisfies that combined linear transformation property. So we can actually derive the standard matrix of a projection directly by just manipulating our formula a little bit. So imagine that we want to project our vector x onto a vector direction u. So the formula that we're used to, that we know and love, is the projection onto u of x is u dot x over u dot u all times the vector u. I'm just going to shuffle the scalars around a little bit here. So the u dot u I'm going to call 1 over norm of u squared. And then I'm going to put the scalar u dot x to the right hand side of the vector u. And I'm going to rewrite it using that transpose notation that we introduced a couple of videos ago. So u dot x can also be written as u transpose times x. So my new expression is 1 over norm of u squared times u times u transpose x. It's still the same formula, just rearranged slightly. Okay, now, there is a property of matrix multiplication which is called associativity. So when we've got a product of three matrices that's nicely defined, then A times the matrix B times C is the same thing always as the matrices AB times C. So in other words, it doesn't actually matter which pair of matrices we multiply together first when we have a sequence of matrix multiplications. So the reason we rearranged our expression like that before was we've written it down as a valid matrix product of three matrices. We were thinking of our vectors as matrices now. So u times u transpose times x is a product of three matrices that is well defined. You might want to pause the video and just convince yourself that that's true. So we can actually multiply the outer product, which is the u times u transpose piece, first. So we can rewrite our projection as the projection onto u of x is 1 over norm u squared times the matrix u, u transpose, all times our vector x. So now we have a matrix times x. So the matrix of our projection is simply a is 1 over the norm of u squared times u, u transpose. So for example, let's just see how this works with a concrete um, vector. So if we want to build the projection matrix of the projection onto the vector 1, 1, it would be a is 1 over 1 squared plus 1 squared times u, which is 1, 1, times u transpose, which is 1, 1 on its side. Expanding that all out gives us 1 half times 1, 1, 1, 1. All right, so let's build this in our applet really quickly. Um, so that means that a goes to half, half. So let's just plop it in the middle there. Change my zoom, I might be able to get that a bit better. 
and so does B. And you can see the, the effect of projecting is it's actually squished our figure down onto this 1-1 one, one line into a flat line. Okay, this is a good time to recall that the range of a linear transformation, i.e. the set of all possible outputs, um, is the set of all possible linear combinations of the columns of its standard matrix. So in other words, the range of a transformation is the same thing as the column space of the standard matrix of the linear transformation. So for our example, the range of A is spanned by just the vector 1, 1. Okay, it's not the whole of R2. Because remember, R2 is the codomain. The range is just the things on the line y equals x through the origin. So this is also an example of a mapping that is not what we call 1 to 1. So 1 to 1 mappings say that only one thing in the domain maps to each element in the range. So we can't have something in the range that has multiple things mapping to it. But for our projection, multiple vectors, for example, both our vectors A and B, all map to the same point. And so this is not one to one. And therefore, it is also not invertible. Okay, because if you want to, to undo this transformation, you don't know where this point half half is going to be mapped to, whether it goes to one one or one zero or what. Uh, any number of points actually map to this point here. Okay, so they all lie on this line orthogonal to it. Okay, so in this video, we got a bit of geometrical insight into what linear transformations are. So one big application of these, which is probably not very surprising after what we've, what we've done today, is in computer graphics and animation. So for example, you can see that being able to move objects around and rotate them and position them and stretch them by just multiplying by a matrix is a pretty powerful tool for actually creating moving things digitally. Okay, so there, there are... Lots and lots of other applications, but I think we've run out of time for now. So we'll catch you in the next one and we'll see you later. Hakite ano.